thanks everyone and hello uh, for joining uh, our webinar today. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, there are some presentation slides and some uh, really cool demo. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, analytics. It's all about data and there is a huge edge aspect to it. So we are going to in the next hour or actually under an hour. Uh, that's our promise. We're going to go through uh, problem definition. Uh, a real, uh, you know, IoT or IIoT use case uh, from the edge. Uh, show you how to gather the data, data pipes. Uh, go all the way, build the model, uh, do the analysis. You know, build the model, deploy the model, and, and see some real time results. Uh, really cool stuff. Our our usual uh, disclaimer and confidentiality. Uh, so what we're going to cover today, uh, more specifically, a quick intro to Tipco. Uh, what we do, who we are, uh, and then we pivot into the problem and how we are approaching it. Uh, uh, Marcelo is going to walk us through the initial part of data gathering through uh, one of our typical labs projects, uh, Project Air. Uh, then we uh, pass it over to Ethir, who uh, does more of the analytics and, and uh, the machine learning model. We pass it back to uh, Marcelo for the actual deployment of the model. And uh, we'll conclude with uh, questions and answers. So I'm going to show you quickly now who Tipco is and uh, as a company, what we do. Uh, it's all about intelligence, intelligence, intelligence with data. Uh, that's the common thread that you're going to see across the products, the messaging, the capabilities. Everything we talk about is uh, bringing the value to your business through intelligence and data. And uh, this. Uh, triple infinity loop you're seeing in the middle, that's our uh, visualization of, of, of you know, how we see this problem and how we think we are, um, uh, we, how we are slicing this, this problem uh, from left to right, connection to the data sources, uh, unification of the data, you know, cleaning up and the security management of that, leading to the right-hand side, the, the prediction. And it's really not that easy if you have worked in any um, even even small company, but you know exponentially harder as the companies uh, grow in size or age, uh, the problem gets uh, really really difficult in many cases. And you know, solving the impossible points to that. Um, so when it comes to connection to data sources, there are a lot of challenges, uh, especially in uh, cases like what we are discussing today. You know, there are a lot of older. Uh, manufacturing devices all over uh, a, a, a plant floor, and uh, sometimes the sensors are not even digital to begin with. Uh, unification is a big challenge for many organizations because of the, uh, you know, organizational uh, legacy systems. Sometimes, you know, just human aspects of it. You know, that's the way that things have been done for decades. Uh, which leads to silos and then bad data management and the prediction or the, the analytics, you know, we call it the predict uh, vertical or column here. Uh, that can also be very challenging because, you know, the, the translating the business problem to a, a technical problem can be challenging, you know, putting it in production can be challenging, tracking the models. All of these are uh, problems that, uh, we see every day, day in, day out when we work with our customers. And these are some of the uh, more detailed, you know, capabilities and, and uh, products that under each vertical or column uh, we offer. It's a, it's a uh, pretty wide uh, range of or breadth of the products that we offer. I'm going to pick just one or two from each each column and, and quickly uh, give you a glimpse of what we do. So when we when it comes to uh, the connection to data sources, we manage a lot of, uh, or we enable API management. Uh, also, very important is uh, we are very good at connecting to both uh, data addressed sources, batch data sources, as well as uh, time series data sources. Uh, when it comes to unification of the data, you know we have uh, uh, very strong offerings for data quality, as well as uh, master data management, which is key uh, to to enable all of the employees of an organization to, uh, first of all, know what kind of data exists before 
uh, we can even decide, you know, who should have access to what. Data virtualization is another uh, huge uh, 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 point of focus for our products to, uh, without duplicating uh, data in all different aspects or, or lines of business data sources, uh, at the same time enable a scalable way of, uh, uh, of, of giving access to data. The, on the predict column, uh, we have uh, very strong offerings in visual analytics for uh, to, to start uh, the, the process of looking at the data, exploratory data analysis, all the way to building uh, with no code or you know with uh, Python or R, uh, or, uh, deep learning models or you know as sophisticated as as you want to get, uh, and also, you know, uh, putting it in, in production and tracking the performance of the model. Uh, switching gears a little bit to give you or shed light on, on, on our business from a slightly different angle, uh, looking at the, the verticals uh, that we serve or we are present. We've been around for uh, more than two decades. And uh, as you can see, we have been, we are present in uh, a strong majority of several verticals from uh, biotech to, to transportation to energy actually that's that's another huge uh, focus for us manufacturing semiconductors uh, for the, the reasons that uh, that everybody's aware of uh, that's been uh, present already but has picked up very significantly over the past couple of years as well uh, food and beverages telecoms in financial sector insurance companies uh, banks uh, you, you name it we are there and uh, this is another, uh, I guess, view of it. If, if I want to map what we're uh, going to show you guys today uh, to, to some of these boxes, uh, you know, starting to think about the actual problem, it's all about turning a sound signal to uh, intelligence and making real, real calls in, in real time. So you can think of a transportation use case. Manufacturing is going to be a huge one. We've had actually some healthcare use cases that, that can map very well to this problem that we're going to see today. And, um, and basically, whenever there is a mechanical piece making some sound signal uh, that has some information uh, hidden in it, uh, that would be a very good fit for what we're going to show you guys today. Uh, looking at the architecture of how we are enabling with our products uh, from an architectural standpoint, uh, these three uh, columns that I talked about, uh, connection, unification, and, and, and predict. Um, so from left to right, we are looking at uh, those functional boxes that deal with connection to the data. As you can see, you know, there are uh, pop-sub capabilities as well as uh, connectors from a whole host of our products to uh, systems of record, you know, uh, at rest uh, tables in pretty much any uh, any popular data source that you can think of. Moving to the, to the next one, to the to its right, uh, we uh, that that's where uh, the uh, data in motion and data address actually happens, and all uh, are offered to an organization through a data mesh architecture. Um, moving all the way to the right, that's where the consumption happens, and as you can see, there are uh, higher level use cases like visual analytics all the way down to, or as uh, as low level for analytics people as writing your own code in R and Python. Also integration with many other uh, third party uh, analytical tools. Uh, in the middle for more, slightly more advanced use cases, many of these uh, data streams actually go through some manipulation or inference uh, before they're consumed. And that's this layer in the middle when the model is, or a model, or a, uh, you know, what we call data function, or, or uh, mods, as we call them in, in different products, they sit in between, they act on the data before, uh, it, the data in motion, or real time, or at rest, before they're consumed. And uh, there's a whole host of features there. And last but not least, before, uh, or, or not before, but for all of these pieces to come to work to come together and work well together you you need to have these two uh, last functional boxes to you know bring everything together glue everything together and also offer security and uh, and and administration and management of access both on the data side or master data management 
as well as on the consumption side to manage the APIs and uh, you know do that in a secure way. Now to uh, overlay what I just showed with our products, I just changed the, from last week to this one, the labels of the boxes with now our uh, products or family of products. So as you can see, every single box uh, maps to a family of our products. So as a reference, you can have that. And uh, for today's problem, we are gonna basically focus on uh, these green arrows. Uh, the uh, bottom one uh, co coming from left, that's where data address happens, historical data, we look at that. And that's the first part that Marcelo is gonna show. And then uh, uh, all the way to building the model that Ethereum is gonna share. And then we deploy the model we go to the top arrow and uh, the model will be deployed in real time to do, uh, to do uh, inference on data in motion. Uh, in terms of you know, who will be interested and you know, can take value uh, from this presentation, um, we are gonna cover a few products and a few personas. So uh, as you see on the top, there's the visual analytics. We are gonna see some really beautiful, like beautiful, both visually as well as uh, information rich visualizations in, in typical Spotfire. The bottom layer is uh, where the model building and analytics happens in typical data science uh, products. And on the right hand side, that's where the uh, management of the models and the management of the, uh, of the data pipes happens. All right, so now that we have established, I'm going to kind of you know ease their way into kind of the problem. Uh, now it's time to get uh, more detailed about uh, the very problem and that, that we are considering today and its uh, specifications. So think about any asset. Uh, it can be uh, a piece of equipment in your energy. Uh, a company or manufacturing, or like I said, um, uh, transportation. Uh, when uh, you decide to uh, take this piece of equipment down or do maintenance on it otherwise, uh, that's, that's when you know, automatically you're making a decision, uh, maybe knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, sometimes you have to decide that on calendar, and that's how some you know, practices work like many people uh, treat their automobiles, their cars like that. So we just take it in uh, every 5,000 miles or every six months, regardless of the condition. But uh, there are two risks with that. And obviously, one is that it, it can break beforehand because of, you know, just random noise in the, in the, in the nature or uh, because uh, you just you know drive in a, in a rugged environment or, or whatever, so that's one risk. On the other side, the risk is you know financial. Uh, the car can be in very good shape already, but because it's six months, you just take it in. Uh, on the other hand, in some other practices, uh, they just wait for the piece of equipment to fail before they bring it down for for maintenance. Uh, which has its own risks, you know, obvious risks. I'm not going to go into too much detail. So on the left-hand side, the chart, uh, the bottom two charts, the left one uh, develops a, uh, a, a probabilistic model of, uh, you know, by uh, time, over time, what's the likelihood of, the, of any piece of equipment to fail. Uh, and as you see, as the time goes by, the, the likelihood goes up. So with that in mind, that uh, probabilistic model in hand, we can map that to financial loss. So uh, the, the right-hand curve on the bottom, um, as you see, the, uh, again, the x-axis is time. So uh, time, time between two maintenances. Uh, one curve, the, the green one, is the cost that you'd pay uh, if you do it on calendar. So as you see, if the interval of between two maintenances is too short, we are paying a lot of cost for you know frequent maintenance. As we make it longer, the cost goes down. The salmon, the other uh, color chart, is uh, the reverse. Uh, if we just wait for something to fail, uh, that has cost uh, unwanted or unplanned um, um, uh, failure 
uh, a piece of equipment has some cost. And at any set uh, set interval between two maintenances, uh, we are risking both, right? So the, the cost, the total cost or expected cost is the sum of the two. And the goal or one way to think about it is to minimize this total cost at the end of the day. And the, the vertical line in the middle actually shows that. So that's the mental definition of the problem we are tackling today. Uh, these are some real measures from some of the analysts in the industry, you know, what this problem is about and how much impact it can have on a typical manufacturing or IIoT practice. Uh, as you see here, you know, these problems can have very significant impact on uh, productivity. And uh, as a result, you know, the expectation by Gartner is that the adoption of IoT exactly for this use case is going to be uh, is, is, is going to see a huge uptick. And uh, the predictive maintenance, the specific problem we are talking about here uh, for, for the more business-minded folks here, uh, these are some, some uh, real numbers by Deloitte Research. Uh, again, a very, very significant productivity boost and uh, reduction in maintenance costs, among other things. Persona-wise, uh, going from this time right to left, or lower level closest to the to the field, all the way up to the executive. Um, by doing this, by the end of this hour that we're going to spend together, the the engineer or the the technician, uh, they're going to have a much better way of prioritizing what to do on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, even uh, because of the the. The intelligence, connected intelligence that we're going to enable today, which also leads to a better job satisfaction. The middle tier, you know, one uh, management layer higher, uh, any manager will be able to run a much you know, a, a tighter ship, if you like, uh, have a more efficient team and, and happier team. And the executives, they can have uh, a lot more product productivity. By a lot, I mean those numbers that we saw in the last two slides a significantly better and more uh, efficient business to run. Uh, the functional views of what we are building today from left, you know, that's where the, the actual data happens, the audio signal. Uh, there's, you know, literally a, a, the data is collected through a microphone uh, and, and a small board can be a Raspberry Pi or it can be as it's, it's containerized, so it can be anything. The middle tier is where the analytics happens and we're going to touch on some of our uh, analytical products and then uh, uh, when it gets to the, uh, deployed in the field on the right hand side that's where uh, model deployed in, in, in real time acts on uh, streaming data and uh, data in motion to on a dashboard actually show the status of the piece of equipment and um, another architectural view of it is uh, the data tier on the on the bottom that's where the uh, uh, audio signal is collected, passed on to Project Air in the middle tier on the left-hand side uh, for, for data pipes and data gathering and then shape of the data to be, uh, to be stored in a, in a data, uh, data store, uh, passed on to the middle box where uh, the, the typical data science helps build the model. And then it's deployed. Uh, the typical Spotfire is actually there to for for visual analytics. We're going to see a lot of that as the surface, where a lot of uh, both visual analytics as well as the results are are consumed. And the top tier is uh, actually where the consumption there or the client tools exist. It can be like I said, typical Spotfire in a dashboard, or it can be anything else. Um, it can be a notification tool or app through API or, or even edge applications. All right. Um, so, uh, Marcelo, are you ready to show us some of the, the real work here? You're on mute. Yes, if you can let me share my screen, please. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I will use your presentation for the time being. I will share the screen later. Okay. Can you put the slides back? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Marcelo Gallardo. I am a member of the Tipco Labs team. 
And in this section, I will give a very quick overview of Project Air and show some of the capabilities. Um, so what is Project Air? Uh, Project Air is an open source initiative from the TIPCO Labs program. Um, it aims to bring intelligent insights from the device to the ballroom. Um, so how do we accomplish this? Um, we, uh, we accomplish this by allowing users to easily register and interact with any kind of um, IoT devices. We also allow to process the device data at the edge or at the cloud or wherever is needed. Um, we also offer the capability to be able to run on, uh, on any edge device or cloud, cloud provider. Um, we also provide capabilities to store and analyze the data as needed and allow to extend every layer of the architecture for easy integration with other platforms. Next slide, please. So in summary, Project Air provides capabilities for uh, connecting to devices and processing its data, uh, managing the data from the devices, uh, creating triggers and flows to respond to IoT events, um, store the data in long-term big data repositories for historical analysis and analytics, uh, the visualization of the IoT data. Also provide a, we provide a customizable UI to monitor, measure, and react to these IoT events, and also combining IoT data with ML models. Next slide, please. So, how is uh, this accomplished? So Project Air is, uh, as we can see in this picture, is layered on top of the um, um, EdgeX uh, framework that's called, uh, it's called EdgeX and it is um, from the Linux Foundation. And it has components that can run at the edge, on-premise or at the cloud. So um, on the Left-hand side, we can see that um, where are all the devices, that's the edge. And then we have components that are close to these devices. Um, basically, we are running the EdgeX framework uh, at the edge. Um, the, one of the layers of the EdgeX framework is called the EdgeX device service. This service translates information coming from devices by uh, hundreds of protocols and formats and bring them into EdgeX. In other terms, the device services uh, uh, ingest sensor data provided by things. When it ingests the sensor data, the device server converts the data produced and communicated by the thing into a common HX uh, foundry data structure and sends that uh, converted data into the core services and into other microservices and other layers of the HX uh, framework. That's where uh, the typical labs project plays a role. So here we are can be in, can use this data coming from EdgeX and use it to create data flows and also to visualize and manage the devices coming uh, from the EdgeX framework. So now that we have covered um, on the right hand side, once that we consume that data. We can post that data and pass that data to the backend applications on, on, that can be on the cloud or on premise or wherever you, uh, the user prefers to use that data. Next. So now you can, Matt, you can let me share my screen and I will actually go over um, and show them what is Project Air. I'll give a quick demo. Oh, sorry, this is not share. Okay, can you guys see my desktop? Okay. Okay, so here's the uh, Project Air provides a user interface for users to interact with the devices. So when the user logins into Project Air, uh, you get into a dashboard. When you click the get started, you get a visualization of the uh, a dashboard with the visualization of the devices that the framework is managing. So in this case, we have represented the devices at my house as a, as a group, as a, we call it a gateway. And here we can explore the different devices and we can actually create logic to use the data coming from those devices. So when you click on the, on the details here, 
we present the different devices that are available in this group. So in this case, I have one similar device that we call REST service. Um, this uh, service, this device has different uh, similar sensors that uh, we have called it here, like image reading, object reading. And we give it this name just to represent the different data types that this uh, device can receive. So when you click in one of these um, sensors, uh, or represent the representation of sensors, we can see that the details for the this specific sensor it gives information like what is the data type that's coming from that the sensor, the mean value, max value, and things like that. And also at the bottom, we can show a history of the data that we have received from that sensor. So in this specific case, we don't see anything as I haven't configured any uh, data flow that is consuming the data from this um, device. Here for this uh, demonstration, I, we have also created a device for the fan. And this fan specifically has one sensor, it has a microphone. And in the microphone, we will receive the data coming from that device. And if we select to do something with that data, we will also show you in the, in the pipelines where we create the data logic to do that. So let's go to, let's, let's create a simple data flow to consume the data coming from this uh, fan and, and consume the audio that, that one of the sensors in that device is producing. To do that, the first thing you need to do is uh, you need to do a couple of configurations like we call it endpoints. And here's where you can create the, specify the connections that like, for example, the channels that you will receive the data. So in this case, for example, I have a channel to receive the data from the HX framework. And here we are receiving to an NQTT broker. So here we have configured the broker um, is ready to be used on a data flow. Uh, here also I have configured another NQTT broker and this is like the air backend uh, NQTT broker that is listening to events that um, can be sent to the air backend to store the data and then show in this uh, dashboard. Okay, as you can see here, I have just configured two MQTT protocol, but we have also selection to use Kafka or AMQP. We are also going to provide a few other protocols in the future, um, and it's, uh, it will be very easy to add to the framework. Another thing that you can configure is like, for example, connections to data stores. And for this demo, for example, we are going to save the data that's coming from this um, fun from the, the audio we are going to store into a database. So we have configured here a Postgres database. And here's the connection information that to connect to that database. A again, right now we are so, um, going to use Postgres, but also the, we have other data, um, data stores uh, available, like for example, Snowflake, Oracle, MySQL, uh, Tipco Graph database or DGraph. Um, one more thing that uh, we need to configure is um, we have already deployed a model that uh, is going to evaluate the sounds coming from the device. So we have configured here how to access that model. So that model has been containerized and has been deployed already. So here is how the from my data pipelines, how can I access that model? So here, for example, I have specified the name of my model. Here's the URL to the model and how can I pass the data to the model, okay? So once that you have all these connections established, you can go back to the main dashboard and then go to the pipeline editor. You click the pipeline icon and here you are presented with an empty editor where you can start creating the logic. At the bottom, you can see existing pipelines that I have created before the demo. For example, if I go here, um, here is a simple pipeline that is just receiving data and then publishing to a data store. So let me demonstrate how easy it is to create a data flow. So you create a new pipeline and then you select the right button and you are presented a list of activities that you can use to uh, create logic use, uh, that you, from data that you receive from the devices. So for example, here I am subscribing, I am going to subscribe to data coming from the devices. And here I select the protocol I want to use. In this case, I, I want to use the Ajax and QTT broker. So I will receive all the data coming from devices running on, on the Ajax framework. After that, you can, for example, select an activity to filter data. 
For example, let's say you just want to consume data from some of the devices. So for example, let's select the feature and then connect. And here you are presented with the devices that are available coming from this um, HX framework. In this case, I have the REST device and the fan. So let's say I just want to listen to device, uh, to the data coming from the fan so I can filter everything from the REST device. So I don't want to receive any from the REST device. I just want to receive events from the fan. And then once that you do that, then you can select, for example, to do some extra uh, manipulation of the data, like for example, calling a model to evaluate that data or just let's say save to a data store. That's what I am going to do in this specific case. So let's do here, select a data store and let's connect activities. And then here you select what, where you want to store this data. So as I showed you before, I have configured only one data store, in this case, the Postgres database. So I select the Postgres database and I presented the, a summary of the data store and that's it. So right now we have a, data flow that will receive the data, it will filter to receive only the fan data and store in a database. So we'll give it a name to this. And so we'll call it this a test pipe. And let's select, this is going to be deployed at the edge. So the type is edge. Some pipelines can also be deployed to the cloud, but in this case, we want to deploy this close to the device. And then we are going to use the air deployer and that's pretty much it. Then, then you save it. And here you can see is in my list of pipelines available to be deployed. So in this uh, example, I have configured this data store that uh, receives the data from the fan, it filters and then it stores in the database. So this data will be used by the data scientist and uh, Amir is going to show how he used the data that we save from the device to create a data model. And then later I will come back and show how once that the model is ready, to be used, how can we create a data pipeline to actually evaluate the data coming uh, from the device through the model and do something with that information? Up here. Yep. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep, thanks, thanks, uh, Marcelo. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ethir. I'm a data scientist uh, here at TIPCO. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the process of uh, modeling the data and tapping into the data uh, after we uh, acquire them at the edge. So at this step, uh, we have we have all the data uh, written to a data source, whether that's on the cloud or on-premise. In our case, uh, we are using a Postgres database on the cloud. Uh, after after this step, we will perform uh, we will uh, tap into the data from Tipco Data Science, which is uh, another Tipco uh, platform, which is I will walk you through in a while. Uh, but the some of the steps we will we will tap into the data. We will perform some uh, uh, some data quality steps, uh, and 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 then we will. Uh, Transform the data into uh, and transform these weight files into uh, numeric uh, arrays in order to prep them uh, for feature engineering, uh, and then we'll also perform some short Fourier transform on them uh, in order to convert them to like uh, uh, spectrograms uh, in the form of like uh, pandas data frame uh, that is suitable for anomaly detection. So let me let me walk you through uh, the typical data science. So the typical data science is an end-to-end -end machine learning uh, data transform and data transformation platform uh, that will uh, provide a low-code to uh, no-code uh, platform, a collaborative platform, to perform all the tasks for uh, the data modeling, starting from data ingesting, cleansing, uh, feature engineering, modeling, and uh, model evaluation. Uh, it also leverages your uh, your local resources, whether you have, uh, let's say, a big data platform on premises uh, or like a Hadoop server or Spark server. Uh, you can tap into these resources from uh, uh, typical data science. And then uh, the in terms of connectivity, you are, you are able to connect to all the uh, common data sources from here, whether they are like big data sources, stream data sources, or uh, data at rest. Uh, you can connect, for example, to S3 buckets, uh, Snowflake, Redshift, uh, Google Cloud uh, Services, uh, Cloudera. 
Um, and then the the also the the ability to uh, um, to use Jupyter notebook. It's it, it's like it has become even better here. Uh, you can um, you can basically create Jupyter notebooks and uh, and use the results within your workflow without leaving the uh, uh, the leaving the the platform. Uh, and then it also worth mentioning that uh, all the let's say all the data transformation results uh, can be saved into a typical uh, virtual data layer where you can access them later on uh, in the process, which is like another uh, typical uh, uh, product. So in summary, what we did here, we, uh, we brought the data uh, from the data source that Marcelo provided us. Uh, and we used three algorithms uh, for the anomaly detection in order to evaluate uh, the, uh, the, the model performance. We used the isolation forest, the autoencoder, uh, and the local outlier factor. And then uh, just to give a summary about uh, every one of these uh, algorithms, uh, the isolation forest was the uh, was the, the fastest uh, algorithm to detect the uh, the anomaly because because of the because of the algorithm ability to uh, isolate the anomalies at the very early uh, stages. The the other two algorithms, the the local outlier factor and the uh, autoencoder, they uh, I mean, they they gave uh, a little bit lower uh, accuracy, but the accuracy that we achieved here was ninety four percent. The local outlier factor is basically uh, a distance-based uh, algorithm uh, to detect the anomalies and the, uh, the autoencoder uses a neural network. So back to typical data science, we use these three algorithms uh, to model the uh, anomalies. Uh, and then we perform some model evaluation in terms of accuracy. And we selected the, the, uh, the model with the highest uh, accuracy uh, now the resulted model is pickled uh, and, and containerized uh, and prepared for like uh, to be used by uh, Marcelo again. So uh, the the like the the ability here is uh, we were able to perform all these data quality cleansing and modeling with a very uh, to like non uh, uh, code environment and also collaboratively where the uh, next step where Marcelo will tap into the pickled model from from uh, from here and this is also like an interactive process so any change uh, we want to do on the model or, or like on the feature engineering we just need to uh, uh, modify the configuration here and then the model will be pickled again uh, and then uh, the like next step that Marcelo will tap into the model. He just needs to like update his uh, connection back uh, to here. So this this ends the step of um, the uh, tapping into the data, cleansing and modeling and and pickling the the model, uh, preparing for containerization. So I'll hand it back to to Marcelo to uh, pick it up from uh, from here. So uh, sorry, qu quick reminder to, to everyone, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A feature of Zoom. We'll uh, most likely handle all of them toward the end, but uh, you don't have to wait until the end. You can post them right now. Thank you. Let me share my screen again. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. So now that the Atir has created the model, he actually shared with us the model and we use the Project Air framework to deploy that model to anywhere we want to uh, run that model. Uh, in some cases, you might want to run it on the cloud, but in many other cases, you might want to run the models close to the devices. Like in this case, like the device is producing large amounts of data. So you might not want to be publishing all that data all the time to the cloud. Uh, in some cases, you want to do that, like for the training uh, scenario, you want to pass all that data while the model is trained. But after the model is already trained, you might just want to just filter that the data and just execute the model and probably send just the results of, of the model. So after the model was created, we came back here to our pipeline creation. And actually I created already a simple 
uh, flow. So in this flow, as I showed you before, I just dropped the data subscriber activity that is listening to all the data coming from the devices in this uh, gateway. And then I call an inferencing activity. In this inferencing activity, you can select a model that you want to uh, execute. In this case, we uh, selected this model. There's only one model available right now, the sound anomaly model. And then you are able to select what data you want to pass to this model. So in this case, we selected that we want to pass the, the data coming from the microphone on the fan, okay? So that data, when we receive, it will go through the model and the model would evaluate and it will give a, a response. So what we want to do with that response, we want to, again, we want to save it to a data store. And again, we selected the Postgres and database. But in this case, we are, we have the, uh, the chance to select what we want to actually save in the data store. So here we are going to, in this case, we're going to store the original reading that's the whole uh, frame of the sound. And then we also going to store the rich reading. The rich reading is um, the result coming from the model. So that's what is going to be a student model. And here we also have another activity that um, I want to show is the error handler. So if any error happens here, the error handler will receive that information. And in this case, I can, I am just going to log it so that users can see the problem. But if you want to have some logic in case the, the error can be handled, you can, again, you can put uh, some other activities after that. So now that we have configured this, I am actually going to show you how we can deploy it. So as you guys can see here, the, the, the pipeline is created. And let me bring here my Docker desktop. So here we can see all the containers that are running in my machine. So here we can see the, the, this audio demo, this is actually the containerized uh, model that's running on my machine. Here I have some the air backend containers. You can see here all the containers are running. And here we can see some of the components that are uh, part of the project air, that the, the, the components that are used for deploying these uh, pipelines to any machine that is uh, selected. And here we have the edge framework. So right now, when I click uh, the deploy, so we are going to convert this configuration, we are going to convert into a typical flow application. This typical flow application then is compiled according to whatever platform we, we selected to the model, the pipeline to be deployed. So in this case, we are deploying to my Mac, so we will compile, uh, uh, create an executable to be run on the Mac. And then we containerize and then is deployed to the machine. So that's what I'm going to do, is click the deploy. And here we can see that deploy was successful. It will take a couple of seconds for the for this process to be done. And here we can see, we can see this new container that was created. And you guys can see the ID here of the container match the ID of the pipeline that was created here. So as you guys can see, it took like a few seconds and now we have a process that's listening to the events from the, from the device is running through the model and then is, is storing the results on the data store. So if I go to my data store here, I have a, a visualization for the data store. And here we have some samples of what we have received. So here we can see that this uh, reading comes from this gateway called Hello World Group. That, that was my name on my, the name of my group. Here we have the device that generated this. This is a device ID, it's called FAN. And here I have the resource that produced here. In this case, this is the microphone. Here, we, if I step over, we can see the whole reading that the, we received from this device. And then at the bottom, we have the microphone in Fairfield, and that is actually the result from the model. So in this case, it's giving us the prediction and also it gives us like um, the percentage of, the, of how accurate is the model. So that concludes my demonstration. As you guys can see, we can easily create the data logic and actually evaluate the data, use the model, and store the data. Amat, you can take over. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, in, in layman's terms, you know, we, many of us, maybe some of you are already, or if not, you know, that uncle or 
you know that relative that is capable of listening to the the sound of the the car when the engine is running and you know kind of you know intuitively tell you if the engine is fine or not and if they're even more advanced in their uh, intuitive skills they can even tell you that not only you know it's it's it sounds weird but also sounds like this part is 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 having a problem basically what we showed here uh was to automate that that relative and then build that into ai uh to to scale and do that at all times um under under an hour under 50 minutes actually uh th there's some details that obviously you need to know you know the uh, both on the modeling part and the the data pipelines but uh but the, the main goal was to cover this you know, very intuitive end-to-end -end use case. Uh, all of these products and then the capabilities are um, uh, in-house typical products. And uh, another very important aspect to, to remind you all again is that uh, when it comes to the consumption or data source, all of these are agnostic. Uh, project layers containerized, consumption layers you know, is very API friendly. So we showed what we showed in terms of the uh, chosen tools, but uh, pretty much everything we showed is agnostic. If you have bits and pieces that match and some other pieces that, that they don't, that's, uh, that's still totally fine.